Great, thanks Pat. Um, well, it's lovely to see so many people um, here today and I should start by laying my cards on the table. As Jennifer said, I'm not a librarian, I'm not an archivist, um, I'm not an IT specialist. Um, I'm, I suppose what could be classed as the end user of um, this type of um, virtual archive. And really what I wanted to talk to everybody about today is the experiences that we've had in um, trying to um, establish a uh, digital archive of images uh, for use in teaching and research um, within the university. Obviously, as a, a lecturer in um, art history, um, uh, the, the, the main tool of my trade and indeed many of my colleagues' trade um, are images. And um, over the years, within various departments within the university, um, large collections of images have been built up, both for teaching and research purposes. I just have some examples up there on the screen of the different types of collection um, uh, that now exist within the university. Um, we have collections that have been built up by individual academics um, in and around their own research, but also for use in teaching. Some of these collections, like uh, Professor Terry Barry's and Professor Roger Staley's, are mainly made up of photographs that they've taken themselves and so the copyright is, issue is, is wonderfully clear. Um, other collections, again, often personal research uh, collections like the Cruikshank Glynn collection, um, have been built up basically by gathering images from lots and lots of different sources. In, in the case of that particular collection, gathered up mainly by chopping up exhibition catalogues over the last 40 odd years and filing them away. And then obviously um, some of the key and largest collections of images uh, the teaching collections. So, for example, in the Department of History of Art, that's one that I would be most familiar with, we think we have in and around uh, 200,000 slides. Now, obviously, uh, with the transfer into uh, using digital technologies in teaching particularly, uh, we're faced with a big problem, um, how to translate these terrific resources um, into easily accessible digital images. And various departments within, um, particularly the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, started trying to address this problem back in the late 1990s when um, uh, various technologies began to come on stream. And typically what we would do is start up a small project, uh, gathering bits of funding from here and there. Often um, funding tended to be available via colleagues in um, the IT departments, uh, in particular, say, computer science. And there'd be often quite an uneasy marriage between our user needs, which are actually quite workmanlike, and then the technologies uh, that uh, researchers in new technologies were interested in developing. And we had quite a number of small projects that increasingly sort of veered away from what our needs were and became sort of more technology than user driven. So when the um, School of um, Histories and Humanities was formed, and departments um, including history of art, history and classics came together, those departments that actually used images most in their teaching, we decided that it was time to pool resources and to be strong and to stand up uh, to the computer scientists and really think very hard about what we wanted uh, and, and to go after that and basically to try and create um, a central cross-searchable uh, repository. So in October 2005, um, a group of us got together, and there's the committee um, from the Department of History, History of Art. I'm actually in a, in a research centre within the Department of History of Art where I have responsibility for some of our collections of images um, and also from the Department of Classics. And we also have the assistance, obviously, of a huge number of other people, but in particular, I'd like to thank Neve Brennan, who's here in the front row uh, from TCD Library, who has done tremendous work with us. We also employed a contract archivist Again, none of us are professional archivists, so we were very, very keen um, to do this right. Uh, and also, when we had the money, um, a project manager. So just to um, acknowledge their involvement. Now, the aims of the project, um, we had very clearly in our minds when we started out. Um, first and foremost, we wanted uh, an image management tool, basically where we could store our scanned images um, and uh, where they'd essentially be easily retrievable for teaching and for research activities within the school. 
Now, because we had lots and lots of separate collections, we were very, very keen to maintain the respect of farms and make sure that each collection was credited to uh, the generator or the owner of that collection. So we wanted um, collections to be um, very visibly um, uh, demarcated um, and also to allow the generators of those collections to have uh, a say in who would actually have access to them. So um, we wanted multi uh, levels of access. Uh, but we also wanted to be able to uh, uh, conduct searches right across the collections so that the art historians could tap into uh, the Department of History's, for example, resources. Uh, very important, um, because we use these images for teaching, was a, a tool that would allow us to retrieve those images very, very quickly, ideally just to copy and paste, for example, into a PowerPoint presentation such as this. And um, we also wanted a facility where we could actually, within um, uh, the structure of the database, uh, create, uh, if you like, uh, discrete groups where you could search across the collections and you could um, pull down images from across the collections and create a, a new discrete collection, if you like, that you could then make accessible, whether to a research group or to a, a particular class. The preliminaries. Again, remember we started in October 2005, so this is the past bit of the project. Again, um, having had the experience of, of generating completely new systems from scratch um, in the late eight, uh, 90s and early um, 2000s, we were really, really keen not to reinvent the wheel. And so we spent an awful lot of time looking at um, the systems that um, various other institutions, both educational but also the cultural institutions in the British Isles were using, both in terms of software systems and also the metadata standards that were being used. Um, the reasons for this are obvious. We, we didn't, as I say, want to reinvent the wheel. If there was something already out there that we could just um, buy or, or you know, um, come in on, obviously that was going to be um, the easiest uh, solution. But what we were really keen on was that we weren't going to have something Heath Robinson that had been made in someone's garage who would then go off to greater things and sort of leave us um, on our own. So we were very, very keen to have, uh, if you like, a mainstream system. Um, so uh, having looked at various software systems, we also then looked internationally at metadata standards and controlled vocabularies that were being used in digital image cataloging. Again, because we were very keen that once our system was up and running, it'd be as flexible as possible that it be attractive to funders, but also that if we wanted to collaborate in, in the future with other cultural institutions, other educational institutions, hopefully we'd be able to do that by, by using um, uh, standard, metadata standards. And obviously, because we're within uh, an institution, we were in constant consultation with TCD Library, uh, with um, our information system services, and then also with the Information Policy Committee. And um, I think at this point it's just worth drawing attention to the fact that when we conducted our extensive survey, we actually saw a couple of systems we really liked. Um, but again, um, key to our needs was the fact that we would get the support of the library and, and their expertise and also the support of IS services within the university. And so ultimately, we had to reach a little bit of a compromise, not much, um, but uh, in the end, what we um, decided to do was to basically piggyback on a project that had been started up, I think, about a year uh, before we joined it, um, a, a DSpace database that was being used um, within Trinity Library uh, for the Trinity Access to Research System, which is essentially um, a system that's making available maybe mainly text research uh, that's being carried out um, within the university. So, for example, digitized dissertations, um, also encouraging academics to upload their own published research um, onto the web. Now, because this system had been set up essentially with texts in mind, obviously we had to um, uh, modify the system somewhat. And this is, again, where the help of the, the library has been um, just absolutely invaluable. We had done our, our bit of research on what we wanted, and we were very keen to incorporate the Visual Resources Association metadata standards, which seemed to be, from having talked to a lot of the cultural institutions, what people were using um, in the cataloguing of images. And again, Dublin Core is being used by the library, so we decided to um, try and incorporate the two. And then also to look at standard vocabularies, um, one of the uh, image collections that's actually um, in the system, which I'll be showing you shortly, was actually in the seat of Getty funding, and they insist that um, 
uh, as a recipient of funding, you use uh, their standards, which are, in fact, um, amongst the best standards anyway for the description of art objects. So we incorporated both the Library of Congress standards, which are already used by the library, but then also uh, thesaurusographic materials and Getty-controlled um, vocabularies. Um, and uh, just to show you, and again, this is really for the benefit of the li librarians and archivists, this, this sort of thing makes me glaze over, um, but just to show how we did this, essentially, um, and particularly thanks again to Neve Brennan um, and Ian Russell, who was working with us at the time, um, we basically um, added in um, uh, uh, the VRA uh, metadata that wasn't already within Dublin Core and uh, conducted a, a crosswalk. And this is just a, a sample of some of the additional fields that were added to the standard metadata that was already um, within the DSpace database. And if I slip up on this, because I'm not as well up on the technology, I hope Neve will correct me perhaps at the end. Um, so um, having set up uh, uh, the database, um, how are we actually going about inputting the images? Well, again, we're having tremendous um, help from the library, but uh, because this is a very user-driven um, and to a degree user-funded as well um, project, what we're actually doing um, is engaging our postgraduate students to, to help in this process. Obviously, it's crucial that um, we um, adhere to library cataloging standards, but to employ catalogers is, as you know, very expensive. Um, and also, um, in terms of our usage of the system, we would tend to search under very particular terms. And I know this is an issue that some of you are interested in. Um, we wouldn't use the terms that library catalogers use to look for an image. So we actually thought it was quite important that potential users would actually be having a say um, in um, data entry. So we have two systems of um, uh, data entry workflow. Initially, library catalogers train our postgraduates in basic library cataloging. The postgraduates then from the individual disciplines will scan images and they'll do the initial level cataloging and then an academic from within the discipline uh, checks uh, the data and uploads it onto the web. Where we have already extant collections that more or less adhere to the metadata that we have, we're actually experimenting at the moment um, with the bulk transfer from FileMaker files, and that particularly um, uh, relates to the Department of Classics, who have quite a lot of scanned images already that are catalogued using FileMaker. And this system will bypass that postgraduate middleman and, and will just then be checked by an academic from the distance prior to being published on the web. Again, just to show you very briefly, and again, this, this sort of thing makes me glaze over, but if you're interested, please do get in touch and we can, we can show it to you in more detail. Um, this is how we get over the problem, I suppose, of um, uh, non-professional catalogers um, cataloging. And you'll see um, on the first page of, of the inputter's interface where there are uh, um, links to the Getty Union list of artists' names to make sure that we're using standardized um, names so that when you're searching, you're actually going to be searching for Jack B. Yates across the collection, not Jack Yates. Um, and they must always sort of click on these uh, URLs to make sure that they're using the controlled vocabularies. And again, um, in terms of uh, the different subject headings, uh, they must go and check the Library of Congress subject headings or supplement them uh, with the uh, thesaurusographic materials um, subject headings. Um, so it, it's quite intuitive, and so far, touch wood, I, I think it seems to be working um, with our history of art postgrads at any rate. But what's the end product? And that's in a way more interesting, I think. Um, this is the, the homepage of the Trinity Access to Research Archive, and if you want to go exploring um, the image collections, and we've really only started... Um, major work um, since really September, so we're, we're just at the early stages. Basically, you click in the um, left-hand margin under Academic Research Units and Collections, and then under the School of Histories and Humanities, you can see the various individual collections that we started work on. So I'm going to show you an example, a couple of examples from the Cruikshank Glynn Collection. Um, uh, these are, um, as I've said, research materials that were collected up by Anne Cruikshank in the Knight of Glynn over about 40 years relating to Irish art from about 1600 to about 1940, we think, big think, uh, around 30,000 images of Irish art, so a really significant um, collection. 
Um, and you can see here um, basic information about the collection. One of the drawbacks of, of this system is that it's not a hierarchical system, and that is something that we might like to address in future years, and that is what I would say is the major drawback of it. So when you're actually trying to um, impose sort of archival standards, that's a, a wee drawback. But nonetheless, um, uh, conducting a search for um, images by Barillet, and I'll just show you there, you, you type in the artist's name, and what comes up is a little list of thumbnails um, uh, with a, a link um, to each record. So let's have a look at Enniscorthy Castle in County Wexford. Again, you get an abbreviated um, record with a thumbnail of the image. Now, we have agonized over the difficulties of copyright and what to do because we want to be able to use these images. This is the whole point of this system. One of the huge difficulties with collections such as this is that most of the images are orphan images. We don't know who owns the copyright. They are photographs of photographs of photographs. Um, but we don't own the copyright to them. What we've decided to do, and this seems to be quite common practice, the Bridgman Art Library are, are doing the same thing, is to issue tiny little thumbnails so you get a sense of what the image looks like. And that's available um, to the public. When you click on that image, however, um, you're asked to enter a username and password. And we can enter in a user group. So it might be all of the staff within the college. It might just be the staff of the school. It might just be a group of students. So um, that limits who can use it. However, if we have a researcher in the States who's really, really keen to see an image, we can then sort of control how that image is actually being um, distributed. So this is our, our sort of compromise. But um, I suspect we're on relatively um, thin ice legally. But that's what we've decided to do from a pragmatic point of view. Um, and then once you have put in your username and password details, you get the, the, the big image up on the screen, which you can cut and paste into your presentation. Just to show you another example, you'll see down at the bottom of this page, show full item record. I'll just show you the image briefly. Um, it's America welcoming Irish immigrants, again, by Barillet. And just to show you the underlying metadata, that, isn't all, that doesn't come up on the abbreviated record, but this is the type of data that we're inputting. So that when you're conducting your Google search or, or looking for the information, um, that's uh, what's um, available to you. And um, I mention the Google searches because one of the things, again, that is going to be particularly very um, valuable, again, I suppose, from the point of view of academics who are constantly seeking to heighten their research profiles and, um, uh, and uh, attract in new research funding, um, the system has been meta-tagged in such a way that it actually uh, uh, comes pretty high up the list when you're, when you're conducting Google searches. Um, and they're just an example searching the Edwin Ray collection where uh, the first six hits all come in on the Tara um, collection. And this, in turn, is very, very useful when one can apply Google Analytics and actually see how many hits you're getting per image, per page. Um, and obviously, this, these are statistics that are going to be very, very useful to us in the future in terms of promoting the work that we're doing, seeking new research funding, and also, I hope, um, forming new networks and, and, and new um, collaborations with, with various institutions, ideally across the world. And you can see there just in the last month, we've, um, the Tara system's had 424 hits from the US, and these maps are great fun to play with. But this is to prove it wasn't all just me trying to make it look good. So just to finish off, I've, I've looked a little bit at the past and the present, and now to talk about the future. Um, what we're finding now as the project takes off, and this is, this is always the difficulty when a project becomes successful, that it, it grows wings and legs, um, and we really feel that we need a project manager. Um, we've been, um, as, a, as a group of individual academics, we've very much been overseeing it ourselves with the tremendous help of the library, but we really need somebody to, to, to oversee the whole project. And that, of course, uh, requires funding. So that's an ongoing um, uh, issue that we're looking at. I think the other um, issue, and again, it's something I'm sure that all of you are, are tackling, is the long-term storage and preservation um, of the archive. Um, in the good old days when we just used to make slides, they went into a drawer and they slowly went purple and got very dusty. And when we pulled them out, we'd rub them on our cardigans. Uh, we can't do that uh, with this. And um, so obviously it's something that we have to be very, very conscious of when we're looking for funding. And hopefully with the formation now of um, the Digital Humanities Observatory, uh, it's very, very timely and certainly we'll be keeping an eye on um, developments there. But I think one of the things, just to, to finish up, that um, I hope with this system, 
often I think when, when one sees systems such as this being set up and tremendous energy is, is put, in, put into their establishment and, and getting it all right and, and then getting the data put in, and then one wonders, well, who actually looks at it and how often is it being used? And I think one of the things we're quite hopeful about is that because it's been user-driven and the users are keeping a constant eye on what's going in and choosing the information that's going in on the basis of the fact that it's the information that's being used in the everyday activities of the various departments involved, that we hope that this isn't going to be a big white elephant, that it's actually going to be sort of a daily uh, tool and, and before long it's going to be a really essential and key part um, of the School of Histories and Humanities. So, thank you. <laughs>